welcome to the Creation Gospel. We are continuing today with the Spirit-Filled Family Series. We have worked our way through Spirit-Filled Husbands, Spirit-Filled Children, Spirit-Filled Singles, and we're finishing up the series with Spirit-Filled Wives. Um, I'm tempted to say we've saved the best for last, but um, I think each role within the family is important. And, you know, as we look in the writings of Peter and Paul as it concerns family and marriage and so forth, everybody has a role. You know, it's interesting that we, we pray daily, you know, grant us our portion in your Torah. Because we all have a portion. We all have mitzvot, commandments assigned to us. And if we're fathers, then we have certain commandments assigned to us. And if we're mothers, we have certain commandments assigned to us. And if we are children, we have certain commandments assigned to us. Um, and those are our portion. So there's no one that's better or worse than the other or superior or inferior to the other. What's important is to know our portion and to do our best that we possibly can with those portions, whatever our role. And so for women, we tend to anchor the home. And that's what we talked about in the last program was, you know, even in the physiological, biological, anatomical differences between men and women, we can see why some marriages really suffer um, because we fail to discern and to respect the role of the other and the contribution of that other to the marriage. And... You know, we might break it down, you know, the difference between male and female. We're not trying to make and say everything over here is male and everything over here is female because personality also plays a role. Um, but we're using the creation itself, this is the creation gospel, to, to kind of set the fundamentals um, perhaps to oversimplify things in order to understand them before we put them back together. And so we said, um, men and women, they're sowers and growers. Men are the sowers, women are the growers. Um, the sowing doesn't take that long, but the growing, it takes a long time. It, it talks in scripture about, you know, how the, the farmer has to wait with patience for the return on that investment. And so the growing process, uh, it does take a lot more time. It takes a lot more intention. Uh, it takes a lot more patience. It takes a lot more resources. But both are critical aspects. If, if we want to produce fruit, we need both sowers and growers. Now, um, women are natural builders. They want to take that raw material and not just fix it. It's not as though it's broken. Uh, I think men sometimes perceive that a lot of the information they receive from their wives is that their wives think they're broken and they're trying to fix them. Um, but not really. Because if you look at that creative process that he put in each of us, what they're doing is they're building. They're taking that raw material, just like in the tabernacle. Everybody brought their raw material in, but it took skilled workers to figure out how to put all this stuff together. And so to get things in the right places and, you know, the, the right colors, the right fabrics and so forth. And so women spend much more time you know, think of it as like your wife is decorating you, if that makes you feel better, um, because she does. She wants to take that raw material, and she wants to build it and beautify it. Men, a lot of times, they're simply happy to keep creating that new raw material without any modification. Um, I'm not sure, I want to say it was Einstein who one time said that um, women go into a marriage um, basically hoping that the man will change and men get married hoping that the women won't. In other words, the men are happy with the status quo and women are trying to build and improve and do more. And so uh, 
that's the difference between the two. That's why I said in the last program, you're not going to hear a lot of women say, you married me like this, you need to be happy with the way I am and quit trying to fix me. You're going to hear that more on the male side because that's the perception. You quit trying to fix me. I was this way when you married me and I'll be this way when I die. And with that sort of attitude, probably you will. But with the women, a lot of times it's the way we're delivering that message as though we believe there's something defective about them when that's not the truth. The truth is the creative process in them is just different from ours. And it is their tendency to cre keep producing this new raw material without really any regard to you know, how much we need of it, how long will it take to build it into something viable. He doesn't consider those things because the, the makeup of the female She's the picky one. She picks the most viable material to build with. She spends a lot of time on it. She'll spend that nine months growing that child, keeping it safe, limiting it, protecting it. And it's by the very act of limitation that that child eventually is ready for freedom. Um, and so, like I said, there's no inferior or superior. It's just that they work together. And so, ladies, what you're going to have to understand is your husband's need to create. We said in the last program we want to make him, not break him. And if he's hearing a message that that work is insufficient because he's sowing, you know, that seed, if he feels like we're criticizing that work, and they will often hear our feedback as criticism. That's why we keep talking about how you deliver the message. If he feels like that work is insufficient, he may quit trying, he may quit listening, and he may quit caring. And you say, well, I'm just doing my job. I'm, I'm trying to take this raw material, these ideas, these resources that he is contributing, and I'm trying to build something out of it. But remember, going back a couple of programs when we, we broke down that word for submission, which means to voluntarily cooperate, to help carry the burden, our role as his partner is to help him carry the burden, not to become the burden. And if the message is being delivered in the form of criticism, sarcasm, and any number of those things that you already know they're wrong. Nobody has to tell you that this is the wrong delivery. You know, one indication is you're not getting the, the result that you want out of it. Like I said, if you've told him 15 times and nothing has changed, he's not liable to listen to you on time 16. Maybe you need to change the delivery method or maybe it's time to give it a rest. You delivered the message, now let the spirit work. Right? Um, but that's so important to remember. You know, that, that phrase to remember in the previous program was the one trying to have the last word is rarely walking in the word. All right, our phrase to remember for this program is our role as a wife is to help him carry the burden, not to become the burden. And so your challenge is to help him focus his energy in small steps. When we make numerous emotional demands on him, it overwhelms him. How many of you have ever noticed that men don't really know how to deal with women crying? All right, It's overwhelming to them. And, and who knows how much of it is actually the difference between the male and the female, how much of it is cultural conditioning. But they simply don't know how to develop or how to react when we turn on the waterworks. All right? And that's not saying don't ever cry around your husband. But what we're saying is be very aware that if you tend to be emotional, they might perceive it as I'm not doing my job. You don't think I'm capable. 
all right? And so if you're making these numerous emotional demands on him, like I say, he, he may kind of back away because he doesn't know how to deal with that. And a lot of times you'll, you'll approach a challenge as a married couple and just the way that that child grows inside the womb over a period of nine months, that's a long time. And that child grows as a series of very small steps. So it's not beyond our ability that if we're trying to help him focus his energy, that we help him in very small steps. Sometimes we have to be satisfied with a small step. All right? You know, it, and we're, we're talking in generalities here, but you can make it as specific as you want to make it, or you can make it as mundane. We tend to argue over stuff that's so insignificant that a week later, we usually can't remember what it was we were arguing about. You know, if it's, you can't get him to take out the trash, well, Let's start with small steps. You know, if it's not actually making it into the trash can, that might be a step. Let's put our trash, you know, if we leave a soda can out, let's make sure all the soda cans are in the trash can before we go to bed. And if he can help you with that way or help you help the children, if it's, if it's at that stage, hey, honey, you know, you know, each night, could you help me make sure that whatever trash the kids have left out on the counter, that it all makes it into the trash can? That's a step. If he won't take the trash out, well, if at any point he takes the trash out, hey, way to go, cheerleader, all that. But he doesn't put the trash bag back in there. What would you rather do? Be the cheerleader for the trash taken out or put the frown on because he didn't replace the new trash bag. See, you have to be, you have to be able to do this in very small steps sometimes, all right? Because his concerns and the things he thinks about, they're not the same as the things that we think about, things that we think he should know. You know, you know we, have you ever heard this? If you love me, you would already know. You know, if you really cared, you wouldn't have to ask. Well, if he's asking, he doesn't know. So what is just obvious to us sometimes is not obvious to him. Sometimes he doesn't know how it affects. To him, it's a small thing. But if he understands how busy you are trying to get this, 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 and this done in the morning, and what a great help it would be in your life if he could take out the trash before he goes to bed every night. If you can make him hear that without hearing it as judgment. Or that he's deficient. He's somehow some horrible husband because the trash didn't make it to the, the trash can outside. See, that's the challenge. Take your successes in small steps. Because you, you overwhelm him. You're not going to get the results you want. And taking something in small steps with some guys, this doesn't work with everyone. Some men are more verbal. If you say, I need you to do three things on Sunday, those guys can remember those three things in order. But others, because remember their nature is to sow lots, they have lots of raw resources, so they're, they, they can be more scattered in the way that they think. They're thinking about lots of different things at one time. If we write it down for them, if he's more of the, the type of learner that if he reads it, or you might want to text it to him. And see, if you text him a list, or you email him a list, or you leave him a list on the refrigerator of a dozen things he needs to do on Sunday, that's overwhelming. You wouldn't do that to your children. All right? But what you do for your children is, depending on their age and stage, is the next thing we're going to do is, and you do that thing. Or let's say you're homeschooling. Okay, in these subjects, this is what we're going to accomplish. It's finite. It's broken down. And that's our ability. 
is to make things finite and concrete and to build them in a practical way. And so if there's a dozen things on your list that's just chafing at you and, and you're just it's aggravating you and why can't he do these things and he's put it off for six months and the list is getting longer okay we're, we're gonna have to take our success in small steps so if you're gonna text him this list don't text him a dozen things it might be remember the message hey honey these things are you know that things we're gonna have to address because if we don't you know, um, fix the gutter, then I think we might have to end up spending a whole bunch more money. But, you know, if you could just fix this place in the gutter, delivery is important. But just give him maybe three things. And if it's a big thing, just make it one thing. Honey, the one thing I really need you to help me with, me, with, see how it's kind of drawing him in and making him the partner, not the slave. All right. If you could help me with this one thing, this I really want you to address the gutter on Sunday. I know you have a bunch of things to do. He may or may not. But if you just say this one thing is really important, you're much more likely to get him to work on that one thing than to give him a list of a dozen things, which he will probably toss. You know, I, I think I'd rather go do something fun. Then look at a depressing list of a dozen things. So take your energy and help him focus it in small steps. The big, huge numbers, the big demands. And see, even if you're having an argument, we tend to dredge up, you know, 20 other things that we're still mad about. And he's like, wow, I didn't know that bothered you. Well, you've had it on that list all this time. And when the conditions are right, you're going to pull out that list of 20 things you're still mad about. But if you do that, the, the argument will never have a resolution. You can't work through 20 issues if you're having a discussion. Keep it on the thing at hand. Keep it on the issue at hand. If you've got a list of 20 things, you know maybe you want to call in a counselor. But there's going to be some other things out there that you're going to try to pull in. Well, what about? Well, what about? You know, we're trying to establish patterns and apply logic and reason, but when you're emotional, not a lot of that is going to work. Pick out the one thing we're going to argue about right now and do it respectfully. <laughs> I respectfully disagree. You know, and here's why. Let's work on this one thing. And then at an appropriate time, you can work through other issues because what that will degenerate into is a competition between, yeah, but you did whatever, fill in the blank. That's just kind of hitting on a practical end. Take your successes in small steps the same way that you would grow that child in you for nine months, you know, there, you're going to have to take that raw material and develop it in a very respectful way. At the moment he feels disrespected, he will probably check out of the conversation. And when he starts writing you out of the conversation, then you don't have a voice. And when you don't have a voice, you cannot fulfill your role as an Azir Kenegdo. And if you aren't fulfilling your role as that voice of the Spirit in his life because you were disrespectful, then really, where does the blame go? Respectful disagreement is going to um, trace back to building the spirit of reverence. If we build our spirit of reverence for Adonai, then we also understand that we have to work on reverence as it's directed toward our husbands, respect, casting out, like we read in the, the passage from Isaiah, you know, that, that what you fear is what you make holy. And if you're going to manifest the negative aspect of fear, then you've actually ripped away the ability to render the opposite side of it, which is the respect 
we give Adonai the proper respect, then we don't have fear because we're fearing the right thing in a positive way. We disrespect Adonai, then we are going to have fears and phobias. And so the more fear that you're feeling in your marriage, probably the more that spirit of your right, respect, reverence, needs to be emphasized. There needs to be mutual respect for one another. And so if what they're feeling is sarcasm, mockery, you know, publicly challenging, especially in front of their children, if you disagree about discipline in front of the children and when someone's just, you know, about dead or something, you know, be careful, you know, but if it's just about disagreement over discipline, we're not talking about a crime here, you know, a beating, just discipline. You know, because a lot of times that, mo that mother will come in there and try to exercise more mercy in the discipline. Sometimes it's the other way around. But if you start disagreeing in front of the children, then you're being disrespectful of one another. Take it to a private place. If you want to intercede for your child, don't do it where the child can hear you. All right. If you think the discipline should be more severe, don't do it where the child can hear you. All right. A lot of times we make mistakes today, but after we talk about them, you say, well, you know, that's a good idea. I was probably just caught up in the moment. I hear what you're saying. If, you know, little Johnny does this next time, I think that's a good idea. I think this would be a better discipline than that. Quarreling with him in public, that is so disrespectful. And it sends such a message. Because when I see, you know, and, and not that husbands don't publicly antagonize their wives. They do. But publicly quarreling with your husband sends everybody the message that this person has trouble with respect. And when I see that, I worry about what your relationship is with Adonai because the two things are related. Nagging. Remember, we'll talk more about how to deliver the message so that it doesn't sound like nagging. Um, but there's a hundred other disrespectful habits. These things don't help. Mockery, sarcasm, you know, public quarreling, nagging. That's not helping. You know, and if it didn't help you the first hundred times... It's not going to help you on time 101. It's time to learn different habits. It's time to learn how to respectfully disagree, how to respectfully advise, right? Um, how to respectfully suggest, right? And you know, a lot of times when a, when a wife is disrespectful toward her husband, she's actually exposing both their nakedness. If it's happening in public, she's uncovering them both. R dignity is something that covers you like clothes. And when you quarrel with your husband or you, you make fun of your husband in public, you're shaming one another. It's just like saying, you know, take off your clothes in public. Because, what does it say? She is clothed in dignity. All right. Same thing for your husband. He is clothed in dignity. And you can put more clothes on him in public, or you can rip those clothes off of him in public. And it becomes indecent. Quarreling in public is indecent. These are not things for public display. You know, Eve was ashamed when she was irreverent to Adonai's commandment. See, her husband was her covering, both spiritual and physical. They were together in it. To mock your husband is to mock yourself. To be sarcastic to your husband is to be sarcastic to yourself. Remember all that mutuality, agreement, equal yoke stuff that we spent so much time on? If we're disrespecting our husband's the same thing is happening to us. It's self-destruction. 
You know, it's, it's just that snake in the garden, the, the word that describes him was arum, or crafty. But that same word also means nakedness. Just like Adam and Eve, they knew they were naked after they sinned. Because they had become like the snake. They had become like the beast. They had conformed themselves to the image of the beast. Because their sensual desires ruled their spirits. What do animals do? They fight in public. All right? They fight for control. They fight for dominance. There's no point in behaving like beasts and conforming to the image of a beast in public. Human beings are made in the image of Elohim. You know what? Abraham did have an argument with God. He's begging for mercy. He's, he's having a conversation. Moses had an argument with God. He said, if you're going to wipe them out, wipe me out. There is a way to conduct the argument respectfully. But just having a big knockdown drag out in public, that's the mark of the beast. That's just behaving yourself like an animal. Allowing the nefesh, the soul, to rule the spirit. That's what you share with the animal world. It's the lowest part of who you are. It's the lowest part of your created nature. The highest part of you, which is your spirit, that's the part of you that's yearning for fellowship with Elohim. And our, our physical relationships, our relationships on this earth, are often indicative of that relationship we have with the Father in Heaven. If we have a history of broken relationships with people behind us, and part of that's normal. Relationships are made, you know, just like any other living organism. There is mitosis. But if you look and, and you see, you know, just serial broken relationships, then I have to wonder, what's going on with you and the Father? Is there a rupture there? Because typically one is indicative of the other. That spiritual part of you that responds to the commandment, that's the part that needs to step forward. As you negotiate and, and ask yourself, what is the most respectful way to disagree? Hey everybody, this is Daniel McGurr with Ancient Covenant Ministries and I'd like to have you consider donating to HRN because everything that goes on here is based basically off of your donations and not only does your donations help you able to watch these programs, but it also helps the message to go forth around the world and to allow other peoples to watch. So I ask you to consider donating your money to the station if you can and if you can't, that's fine too. But please consider donating to HRN. Thank you. Welcome back. Let's talk some more about this beast. You know, the, the issue is public quarreling, fighting in public. Um, there is a place, like I said, where we can negotiate an argument, you know, but we can do it respectfully because if you think about the way that the snake or the way that a beast responds to the voice of Elohim, it's a primal urge. That beast is subject to hunger, thirst, or a drive to reproduce and protect offspring. Primal. But see, we're different from just that. When we hear the voice of Elohim, it shouldn't just be a primal urge. And that's what he was trying to tell the Israelites in the wilderness. You know, I'm giving you bread, but I'm giving you the bread of heaven. You're making it physical bread. But I want you to, to crave the, the spiritual bread. I don't just want to give you physical water. I want you to have spiritual water. But you're being controlled by those primal urges, those primal needs of the nefesh. You know, those primal needs to even to protect offspring. You know what a beast will do to protect its offspring? You don't want to get between a mama bear and a baby bear. So there, there's a strong primal urge to reproduce and protect offspring. All right? But so many times as we engage in a quarrel, we're engaging it like a beast, not like a human being. 
We're trying to protect that territory, but in a primal way. See, a, a human being should respond to the commandment given through the word, and it's completely objective. It's not just a primal urge. It's engaged in the spirit realm. It's not just intuitive. It's not just instinctive. You know. And now to the bear's credit, she protects her offspring. But being a human being is so much more than that. We're not saying that the drives of the nefesh, those primal things, are evil. They are not. They are necessary to our very survival. However, they must be subject to the spiritual commandment. And we know that the spiritual commandment is to have respect, to have reverence for Adonai, and to have reverence or respect for people. You see, if we look at a commandment as something simply to be engaged at the level of the flesh, or even just the nefesh, we're still naked. But as human beings, if we engage it with spirit, soul, and body as a human being, because the spirit part of us is made in the image of Elohim, but if we can master that nefesh, that soul, those primal drives that make us want to protect our territory, then we're much more likely to be able to transmit those messages in a respectful way instead of becoming just, you know, inflamed with our right to be right. And so when we engage in a quarrel with the Spirit, you can quarrel with the power of the Spirit. And by quarrel, I mean disagree. Give different opinions. But when you can do it engaging the Spirit, you can actually cover yourself with the garment of Yeshua's righteousness because He is the Word. That's what it says a virtuous woman does. She clothes her family with scarlet. It's a color of redemption and atonement. But see, letting desire master the spiritual commandment results in naked families. And so as, as you and your husband, you work through these problems, most of them are rising just out of the difference between male and female. And part of that is difference between personalities. You know, as we engage it, we have to be very, very careful not to let the nefesh begin to commandeer the argument. Because when the nefesh starts to commandeer the argument, you as a wife are ceasing to function in your role, which is to help. Because there again, if you're not helping him, then you're not functioning in his role. If he can't hear your message because it is the strong primal urge of the soul speaking through you, not the spirit, you're hindering, not helping. And so what we want to, to see, we don't want to see our spirit succumb to the nefesh. Then the argument becomes primal, and it's driven by competition. And see, that's where those fears, those negative fears can come in and replace respect. Because remember, those primal urges do keep us alive, and it is a legitimate concern. If you say, our family needs to eat, our family needs to nurture its young, our family needs security, that's not an evil desire. But when the fear concerning those things replaces respect, it is out of order and nakedness will result. There will be things said in the argument that you don't want said. You'll say things that, in hindsight, might have been true, but they didn't need to be said. Because what it did is it, it damaged the value that was rendered to the other. A spiritual woman will respect her husband even in disagreement. 
And in fact, the word says that if, if husbands have gone so far as to sin, respect for him will more likely have an impact on his repentance than any one word of rebuke. He already knows the commandment. He knows he transgressed the commandment. The greater impact is that you continue to give him respect as a human being. You don't have to respect the behavior. You don't have to respect the transgression, but a human being is a human being. Now, that's not natural for us to be able to do that. It's just not. Because that power of the nefesh is so strong. That nefesh, remember, it's, it's trying to recover security. And it thinks that recovering security means I need to control the situation. I'm the only one that knows how to control the situation to salvage it. But that's not true. It's the spirit that needs to control the situation in order to salvage it. And the soul must be a willing participant in that process. Your worst fears have to subject themselves to the word. And the word is spirit. The Torah is spiritual. And like I said, it's not natural. But ladies, we have to be gentle. It's reflected in gentleness. All right? We, we just don't... Um, <laughs> we, you don't keep beating beyond the ability to penetrate. All right. If you feel like I'm knocking on this door and I'm knocking on this door, I'm beating on this door, I'm kicking on this door and he's not listening, well, let's back off and let's say, hmm, what does the word say? I know how I'm feeling. I know what my primal urges are. My primal urge is to kick this door down and make him listen. But the spirit says, it's the spirit of reverence. It's gentleness. It's humility and becoming a messenger of respect. Even when that message contains something he doesn't want to hear, I can nevertheless deliver that message with respect and leave it there. Give it a rest. That's the seventh spirit of Adonai. So ladies, he's actually really given us the most difficult thing. If you think about it, that's the sum of all of it. It's the seventh in number, which means that's everything that went before. It's being wise. It's being understanding. It's being full of counsel. It's knowing levels of authority. It's being powerful. It's being loving. All those things actually make up respect. When you put all those things together, they culminate in the seventh spirit, which is the spirit of reverence. So we have a hard job. If we are disrespecting our husbands or disobeying a request that he has delivered to you, like Messiah, the way that, that Paul instructed him to treat you with a gentle spirit of knowledge, treating you the same way that Messiah treated the believers, the congregation. If we are disrespecting someone who's speaking to us in that gentle way, ignoring his requests, making him feel less val valuable, then we're doing a work of the flesh. We're doing the work of a bondwoman. We're doing the work of Hagar. Because ultimately, Hagar is representing that, that most primal, slavish, being a slave to your nefesh. See, a bondwoman, Hagar was a bondwoman. She was a slave. She didn't have a choice. Sarah was a free woman. That's what it means to submit a voluntary spirit of cooperation. Helping to, to bear that load, like being in the yoke with that other ox. The bondwoman doesn't have a choice. She's a slave. 
And what that does, it produces disobedient, foolish children like Ishmael. Children driven by their urges. Children driven by emotion. Children driven by a need for immediate gratification. Children who are hunters, predators. And so, in terms of what the marriage produces, if we can function like Sarah in a spirit of reverence, then we can produce Isaacs in terms of the fruit that comes out of our marriage. I'm not just talking about children. I'm talking about if, if we're working together in the kingdom, then we're going to produce some things within the body of Messiah, within those spheres of influence that we have. But if we're functioning with one another at that primal level, like a Hagar, then we're going to produce a lot of foolish things out of our marriage. Because what is produced is driven by the same primal emotion, mastered by the same primal emotion as the bondwoman. Because it wasn't that voluntary mutual respect. What do we know about Hagar? She was a taunter. What do we know about her son? He was a mocker. So who do you want to be in your marriage? Do you want to be a taunter? Do you want to be a mocker? Or do you want to reflect like Peter and Paul are saying, this gentle spirit? And so, you know, by the same token, we feel like we're always the ones giving the messages to our husbands. Sometimes they're trying to talk to us too. And we can be just as difficult as they can in terms of receiving the message. And so if he's delivering that message in a respectful way, then we should be very careful not to mock, dismiss out of hand, you know, say that's dumb, that's stupid, that won't work. And he said, that's an idea. Let's think about that. Because sometimes when somebody suggests something the first time, it's like, oh, that won't work. But after you think about it, you might come back the next day, you know, I've been thinking about that. There's something there we could work with, you know. And so the way you receive a message a lot of time has as much to do with the spirit of reverence as it does in sending the message. Remember, a voluntary attitude of cooperating, a voluntary attitude of assuming responsibility, a voluntary attitude of carrying a burden, a wife's cooperation with a godly husband is voluntary. Remember, we said that's what made it holy back at the signing of the ketubah, back at the moment of Kiddushin and, and the giving of the ring, because nobody forced her into that marriage. She willingly engaged. She was not forced. She was not coerced. And that's what Peter said. We do well when we reverence him without any fear. And by that he means without any negative manifestation of fear. He's saying not the negative aspect, but with respect. I mean, even Rivka, Rebecca, was consulted as to whether she would marry Isaac. It was not a unilateral decision. She consented to carry the burden of the covenant with him for a lifetime. And in fact, at the moment when he was ready to make a blunder, in terms of passing on the blessings of the covenant, she stepped in. So understanding that this is a choice that we made. We voluntarily married our husbands. Nobody forced us. You know, nobody held a gun to our heads. We entered into that marriage. We weren't kidnapped and forced to marry. We weren't sold as slaves to our husbands. Right? That happens in other places. But that's not the path that we're on. We chose our husbands. 
as much as he chose us. And when we chose our husbands and we chose the obligations of the covenant, then we pretty well forfeited our right to murmuring and complaining. If you're a full partner, you don't murmur and complain about the company. You're invested. We are full partners in our marriage. We're not even half partners. We're full partners in our marriage. We are 100% invested. That is our company. That is our corporation. And if we walked around the company, up and down the halls, murmuring, complaining, well, he did this, he did that, I don't understand why he did this, I wish he would have done that. Well, that was foolish. I would have done it this way. Murmuring and complaining, that's not acceptable in any other corporation. So why would we do that in our marriages? Why would we sabotage one another by murmuring and complaining? If we are full partners, we're sabotaging ourselves. I mean, can you imagine one of these chain restaurants taking out ads on television to tell how bad their food was? How long would they stay in business if they took out ads to tell everybody how rotten the food and the service was? Well, have we ever taken an ad out to our friends or to our family or to our children and complained about how bad the service was in this marriage? How long are we going to stay in business if that's the way we conduct a marriage that we entered into with full agreement? You know who would make comments like that? Paul told you. Her name was Hagar. See, a slave or a hired servant, they are the ones who murmur and complain about the company because they are less than full partners. They're either forced or they're receiving a wage and they can move on somewhere else and get paid a wage somewhere else. If they're a slave, I don't have a choice. You can't make me like it. You might make me do it, but you can't make me like it. See the difference in attitude? See why we need that voluntary attitude of cooperation, that gentle spirit, instead of taking on the murmuring and complaining? I said, Anything that grows out of a relationship like that is highly likely to resemble its foolishness. You're going to produce what you create together. A full consenting partner, she bears up under the burden. She looks for solutions. She looks for avenues of success because she is in the partnership. No owner of a company would gossip and complain about it publicly. The stock will drop. It will damage the value of the company. But if you're a partner, even if you know there are problems, you start working on those problems in a discreet way, and you look for ways to increase the public trust. Right? And so the, the words that you speak about your husband, not just inside your home, but outside your home, those words can increase public trust in his character. You are to be his greatest promoter. You are promoting that company because you're a full partner, a consenting partner. Hagar is the slave woman. She's rebellious. She's mocking. She's irreverent of authority. She fights for first place. And that is the spirit of unsabbath. That is a spirit of contention. There is no rest in that attitude. This is not a covenant wife who cooperates with love. Do you remember our saying? The one who strives for the last word is rarely walking in the word. See, the corporation is not in competition with itself. It may need to do things to improve itself, 
but the, the competition is not within. When you start fighting battles and creating competitions within the company, you're destroying it from the inside. You work on the problems from the inside and you still actively promote it on the outside. Like we said, you increase that public confidence. And in terms of your husband's reputation and his dignity and his honor, remember you're the one who puts clothes on him in public places. And it talks about, in Proverbs 31, how her family has no fear of the winter time, the, the cold weather, the tough times, because she's clothed them in scarlet. Your family is going to go through tough times. Your family is going to, you know, go through some perilous waters together. You're going to hit some winters of discontent. See, a good wife will clothe her family. She will ensure their public dignity. She will not publicly murmur and complain. Yes, bad things are going to happen, but clothe that family in scarlet. Scarlet means a redemption. It's, it's a wonderful thing to know that your family has your back when you go through tough times. And so, there again, don't let the competition come from within. Don't fight for the right to be right. Don't fight for the last word. Right? You know, and here's even a challenge for you. If, if you like challenges, some people just like listening and, you know, picking up a thing here or there. Oh, there's a good little saying here. There's a good little insight there. But they don't like to, you know, really deeply study. But if you do, if you hear some things in here, maybe they're making you mad, angry, not mad, crazy. Maybe just they're uncomfortable. Well, trust me, <laughs> I can't speak except from experience, if, if that helps you at all. All right? Maybe you hear things you agree with, but you would like to embed some of these principles um, in a deeper way. You know they're right. But you'd like to explore them some more. You would you'd like a more practical application. I want to study more from this program than just listening and moving on to the next one. Well, if you can, find a study partner. That's my recommendation. Find somebody that's of like kind and like mind. How about even your husband? All right? Or an older child. And turn to Galatians 4.22. And as a study text, read Galatians 4.22 through 5.1. Read it together if you can. Maybe even read it in, in different translations. If you read English, fine. Um, but maybe even try and amplify it in addition to an easier reading or a, a NASB or a, a New King James. Get some different perspectives on Galatians 4.22 through 5.1. And Paul is writing a letter to the Galatians about covenant. And he's, he's exploring Israel's behavior toward their covenant with the Holy One. And so in his letter, he's, he's working through some issues with the covenant. And if you, you truly want this challenge, look at the pattern or look at the characteristics of how Paul is describing that covenant relationship between the Holy One and Israel. You know, going back again to the principles we've covered so far for Spirit-Filled Wives, that we entered into it voluntarily. We're consenting to participate. We agree to help take on the load. We, we agree to have a, an attitude of volunteerism. Nobody is coercing us. Explore what Paul's saying in that letter to the Galatians, and then maybe put some characteristics that you're seeing of that covenant relationship that Paul's talking about. Maybe list them on one side of a page. Say, so I think these are the main points here. 
in terms of that covenant relationship. And then on the other side of the page, take into account some of the issues we've explored from the Word about marriage and our relationship to one another. And on that other side of the page, write down how you think what Paul wrote to the Galatians actually relates to an earthly marriage. What can we say from what he wrote? How can we take this over and apply it to an earthly marriage? What points of similarity can we find? What can we find there to improve a marriage of our own? That's your challenge for this program. See you next time.